hello friend today i am creating a new react video mm, the name of the video new fact uncover it about american president donald trump fbi pick confirmation vote looms please see it if you like this video please subscribe my channel thank you we think we are just hours away from the republicans trying again for another vote on another version of their legislation that will result in more than 20 million americans who now health have health insurance losing all their health insurance coverage uh, this is why the senate hasn't gone on vacation this is why protests to try to hold on to the affordable care act have not been letting up around the country uh, as recently as today and into tonight, senators apparently have no idea what they're going to be asked to vote on tomorrow, but they are going to be asked to vote tomorrow. So really all eyes on that tonight. We're going to be talking with a key senator tonight who is in the middle of that fight, one whose town halls have been looking like this <laughs> since the health care fight started. Uh, so that's ahead tonight. Here's something else to keep an eye on that has really not been making headlines, but it should. I mentioned that the health care thing is the reason that the Senate is not going on their usual epic vacation that they typically take around this time of year. That matters this year, not just for senators' vacation schedules and whether they get to spend time with their families and going to the beach and blah, blah, blah. It also uh, doesn't matter just for the not inconsider inconsiderable question of whether they're going to use their extra time in Washington to try to take health insurance away from over 20 million people. There's an additional reason their vacation schedule really matters this year. And that's because the president today spent yet another day taking skin off the hide of his attorney general, Jeff Sessions. The president told the New York Times last week that he wishes he hadn't hired Jeff Sessions to be his attorney general. He told them that Sessions should not have recused himself from overseeing the Russia investigations at the Justice Department. The president even suggested to reporters last week that Jeff Sessions might have lied to the Senate under oath about his own contacts with Russian officials. And that matters not just because being attorney general is a big deal, not just because the president and his attorney general are thought to be so close, so there's some human drama here. This really matters for all of us in the country because of the gigantic scandal looming over this administration. Because as we have been reporting, if the president somehow gets rid of Jeff Sessions as attorney general, the president would be in a position to replace him with somebody else who was not recused from overseeing the Russia investigations at the Justice Department. And that Trump choice to replace Jeff Sessions could then be in a position to get rid of Bob Mueller, to, to fire or otherwise block the Trump-Russia investigation that's being conducted by the special counsel, Robert Mueller. So whether or not Jeff Sessions stays is really important. And that factor is why it's now way more important than it usually is to know when and if the Senate is going on vacation. The, the shortest, easiest, most direct, most unstoppable way that President Trump could get rid of Jeff Sessions in order to replace him with somebody else who could fire Bob Mueller, the, the shortest, most direct, most unstoppable way for him to do that is for him to wait until the Senate is in recess. And then fire Jeff Sessions and make a recess appointment of a new one. Make a recess appointment of a replacement attorney general, and that would allow that person to serve as attorney general without Senate confirmation until, I think, 2019? Plenty of time to kill off the Bob Mueller investigation in any case. Now, this top Republican in the Senate, the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, he could stop something like that if he really wanted to by technically never letting the Senate go into recess. He did that during the last administration to stop President Obama from making any recess appointments. We have no idea whether he would do the same thing here to stop President Trump from kiboshing the Mueller investigation through that kind of a maneuver. But the Washington Post, late tonight, they're reporting that the White House is actually having discussions about this prospect now. Quote, President Trump and his advisors are privately discussing the possibility of replacing Attorney General Jeff Sessions, and some confidants are floating prospects of who could take his place were he to resign or be fired. Members of Trump's circle 
including White House officials, have increasingly raised the question among themselves in recent days as the, as the president has continued to vent his frustration with the attorney general. Replacing Sessions is seen by some Trump associates as potentially being part of a strategy to fire special counsel Bob Mueller and end his investigation into whether the Trump campaign coordinated with the Kremlin to influence the 2016 election. So, vacation's always interesting. <laughs> but this is why we right now really are nationwide on vacation watch for the U.S. Senate with a renewed intensity. The Senate going on recess really could be the opportunity the president is looking for to push Jeff Sessions out, to bypass Senate confirmation, and to get somebody in there to fire Bob Mueller. So, heads up. Speaking of Jeff Sessions, the top Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, Dianne Feinstein, has issued a public letter demanding that the Attorney General come in and testify in the Senate to clear up whether or not he lied to them previously about his communications with Russian officials. Washington Post reported on Friday night that U.S. intelligence agencies intercepted communications from the Russian ambassador communicating back home to Moscow to his superiors. Um, they intercepted communications that said that the Russian ambassador had been discussing the Trump campaign and U.S. policies toward Russia with Jeff Sessions when he spoke with him during the presidential campaign. Sessions himself told the Senate in writing that that never happened. He told the Senate in writing back in March that he didn't recall any discussions with any representative of the Russian government regarding the political campaign. Now, it's possible the Russian ambassador was lying about his meetings with Jeff Sessions. It's possible Jeff Sessions was lying about his meetings with the Russian ambassador. But at least the top Democrat on the committee that oversees the Justice Department uh, would like to figure out uh, who was lying, because one of them was. So far, the Republicans on the committee uh, don't seem as excited <laughs> as the Democrats do about the prospect of having the attorney general come by and get sworn back in again. Uh, we'll see. More on them in just a second. But today, of course, was the first day that a serving senior White House official spoke to the congressional committees that are investigating the Russian attack on our election last year and the possibility that the Trump campaign was in on it. White House senior advisor and presidential son-in-law Jared Kushner was named in May by the Washington Post as a person of interest in the special counsel investigation into the Trump-Russia affair. After multiple bouts of him not disclosing his various meetings with Russian officials during the campaign and during the transition, uh, we're not sure why today was different, but today Jared Kushner decided that he would disclose a new one. He waited until today, until his, his interview with the Senate Intelligence Committee was scheduled today to disclose yet another meeting <laughs> that he took with a Russian official that neither he nor the White House uh, or the campaign ha had previously disclosed. Uh, we will be talking with a senator on the Intelligence Committee about that tonight, as well as Mr. Kushner's confirmation today that he did talk with the Russian ambassador about trying to set up a classified means for him to communicate directly with the Russian government during the transition. So today, Jared Kushner met with the Senate Intelligence Committee. Tomorrow, he meets with the House Intelligence Committee. Both of those meetings are behind closed doors. For some reason, today's was not under oath, but tomorrow's is under oath which I don't get at all, but honestly, Congress can be a little hard to follow when it comes to closed hearings and classified material. But there are, there are two other things to watch for that are about to happen that I think are worth kind of sticking at the top of the show here tonight. Right before the election, you might remember that Slate.com made a splash with a long, densely reported piece about unexplained, extensive data transfers, maybe? At least extensive electronic communication between a computer server associated with the Trump campaign and one associated with Alpha Bank. Alpha Bank is a large Russian bank. It's considered to be closely linked to the Russian pres President Vladimir Putin. Alpha Bank maintains that these transfers between its server and the server connected to the Trump organization, that the Alpha Bank maintains that those, those electronic communications were totally innocuous. The Trump campaign said at the time, quote, the Trump, camp the Trump organization has no communication or relationship with this entity or with any Russian entity. 
So they both deny it, but the Alpha Bank and the Trump Organization servers thing denied in terms of it being any nefarious by both parties involved. But that Alpha Bank thing has remained sort of a loose thread for people trying to get to the bottom of the connections or lack thereof between Russia and the Trump campaign while Russia was attacking our election last year. Well, whether or not you've ever cared about that before, tomorrow in the Senate, President Trump's nominee to lead the criminal division of the Justice Department, uh, he's going to get his confirmation hearing. Tonight, the New York Times reports that, hey, it turns out he worked for Alpha Bank. In fact, he supervised a review of those mysterious communications between the Alpha Bank server and the Trump Organization server. He supervised one of the reviews of those suspect communications that, that ultimately pushed back on the suggestion that there was anything weird at all in those data transfers or electronic communications between the Trump campaign uh, and, and his client, this Russian bank. So that, that confirmation hearing will be tomorrow. I should mention that this isn't just any nom nominee, right? Running the criminal division of the Justice Department is a really big, hairy deal. Among the people who once held that job is Robert Mueller, who is now the special counsel on the Trump-Russia investigation. Of course, the even more high-profile past job that Robert Mueller is even better known for is having been the director of the FBI. And that is the other thing that has popped up today that you really should keep an eye on. Last week, uh, you might remember, if you watched the show last week, you might remember that we rousted NBC presidential historian Michael Beschloss from his vacation um, to give us a historian's perspective on uh, the other, I think, legitimately shocking thing that the president said last week in that same interview where he started threatening and publicly regretting his choice of his attorney general. Um, and I say you might remember that moment from this show last week because Michael Beschloss's response when I asked him about the president's comments, it was not the kind of thing I was expecting, and it was not the kind of thing you typically hear from a historian. He said that the FBI director should report directly to him as president. Then immediately thereafter, he said, I think we're going to have a very good new FBI director. He was citing what he described as historical example in terms of explaining why the FBI director should appoint direct, should, should, re, uh, should, should report directly to him. Was he correct in that? No, he was not. I found his suggestion of the FBI director uh, working directly for the president, reporting to him, that is absolutely blood chilling. Blood chilling. Coming from Michael, coming from Michael Beschloss, that's the kind of thing that sticks with you. What Michael Beschloss found blood chilling was this uh, short argument from the president in his New York Times interview last week. Um, I'll, just, I'll quote you what he said. I have noted before that the president does not usually speak in a way that transcribes well, and I do not mean that as an insult. It is not a sin. I also do not speak in a way that transcribes well. I get it. But even so, with this verbatim transcript, you can clearly get his meaning here. Here it is. Quote, when Nixon came along, inaudible, <laughs> we don't know what the next word was, when Nixon came along, was pretty brutal. And out of courtesy, the FBI started reporting to the Department of Justice. But there was nothing official. There was nothing from Congress. There was nothing, anything. But the FBI person really reports directly to the President of the United States, which is interesting, you know, which is interesting. And I think we're going to have a great new FBI director. And then the Times reporter Maggie Haberman says, Chris Ray, And the President says, he's highly thought of by everybody. Chris Ray, the president's nominee to head up the FBI. He may be highly thought of by mostly everybody, if not everybody, but if he is being nominated to run the FBI by a president who is arguing overtly that the director of the FBI works for him directly and reports to him directly, a president who's now arguing that the FBI should basically be the president's agency and should no longer be seen as part of the Justice Department, that is kind of blood chilling. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, did Christopher Wray accept this nomination from the president on those terms? When he accepted this nomination from the president, was it with the understanding that this is the way the president sees the FBI? 
because the president is now saying publicly that as far as he's concerned, the FBI reports direct to him. The FBI director personally reports direct to him. Did Ray agree to that when he accepted the nomination? Surely the Senate would want to know that before they voted on whether or not to confirm him, right? Apparently not. The day after the president made those remarks to the New York Times, the Judiciary Committee in the Senate voted to approve the nomination of Chris Wray to lead the FBI. It was a vote of everybody to nobody. It was a unanimous vote to approve him in the committee. He still needs his full vote in the Senate, and that is expected to come up quickly. But now, WNYC reporter Matt Katz, WNYC, who made a national name for himself with his reporting on the Chris Christie Bridgegate scandal, now Matt Katz at WNYC has new news about Christopher Wray and his last big gig before being nominated by President Trump to lead the FBI. During the Bridgegate scandal, where the Christie administration in New Jersey was accused of shutting down access to the busiest bridge in the country, basically as a matter of political revenge, and where three appointees or staffers of Chris Christie pled guilty or were convicted. During that scandal, Governor Christie retained Christopher Wray to be his personal attorney, representing the governor in that scandal, with the legal fees all billed to the citizens of New Jersey. Well, through a public records request, WNYC has now found that there is something a little weird about that agreement. Namely, it appears that the taxpayers of New Jersey started paying Christopher Wray to represent Chris Christie in the Bridgegate scandal all the way back in 2014. But that fact was never publicly disclosed. Well, at least it publicly wasn't disclosed for a very long time. They never even filed the paperwork to make it official until Christopher Wray had already been on the job, doing the job for 11 months almost a year, billing the taxpayers for his work. All the while, Chris Christie was gearing up for his presidential campaign without having to answer any pesky public questions about his legal fees being picked up by the taxpayers of his state because nobody had any way to even know that was happening for almost a year, which politically was great for Chris Christie at the time. It was not necessarily great for all the taxpayers who were paying those millions of dollars in legal bills all that time to Christopher Wray and his firm with no way to know that they were doing it and therefore no way to question it. WNYC is also reporting that Christopher Wray stayed on the public payroll in New Jersey. He and his firm kept working for Chris Christie on Bridgegate even after the trial was over. Even after the trial ended and Christie's staffers and appointees were convicted and sentenced to prison, we're not sure why Christopher Wray stayed on. We're not sure why Chris Christie still needed private legal representation on the Bridgegate matter at taxpayer expense at that point after the trial, but he kept getting it, and the taxpayers kept paying. And then, not long thereafter, Chris Christie apparently recommended Christopher Wray to President Trump as a good, a, a good choice to, to go run the FBI. He's already passed through, his nomination has already passed through the committee. One vote left sometime very soon in the full Senate. Joining us now is Matt Katz. He's a reporter with WNYC who broke this story earlier today. Matt, thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. You got it, Rachel. Thank you. Um, how is this supposed to have worked? Yeah. And how did it actually work? How big is the distance between the two? Sure. I mean, normally you hire an attorney, and government entities obviously hire attorneys all the time, and you have a contract. You have a, a retention agreement, and then you figure out how much you'll be billing, and you go ahead and the representation begins. In some circumstances, if there's some sort of emergency, uh, if your legal represent representation is needed immediately, uh, then it might take a couple of weeks between the time the lawyer starts working and the government signs a retention agreement with the attorney. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I spoke to as many lawyers as I know and as a reporter know a lot of lawyers and nobody had ever heard of this lag time. It took 11 months uh, before any sort of retention agreement was signed. Uh, and, and he is, Chris Ray was billing the whole time. He didn't officially send the bills 
into the state of New Jersey so they could be paid for by the Treasury, but he was billing. In fact, from September 2014 until Christmas of 2014, him and his colleagues worked every single day except for three days. They were doing a ton through of work. Through the weekends and everything. Through the weekends and everything. They were doing a ton of work for Chris Christie. We don't know what that work was because Chris Christie was never charged. Um, we do know one thing. The only thing we know that he did was hold on to Chris Christie's cell phone. Chris Christie's cell phone became uh, a topic of interest in the Bridgegate scenario because he had texted an aide uh, during a key legislative hearing in which the whole scheme started to unravel. And they had a series of text messages that went back and forth during very uh, important times of this hearing where new details were arising. And that's a, a cell phone, perhaps the head cell phone, is one that Chris Ray was holding on to Chris Christie. Uh, we were holding on to for Chris Christie. And but, that was of investigative interest, right? Wasn't that cell phone the subject of a subpoena? Uh, the defense... The former Christie aides who ended up getting indicted and convicted for this crime, uh, they sought this cell phone. The judge ended up quashing that. Ah. But that became an issue in the summer of uh, 2016, right before the trial, after Chris Christie's presidential run flamed out. And that's the first time the public ever knew the name Chris Ray. We had no idea Christopher Ray was representing the governor. And while he was representing the governor on the public Dime, if I had filed a public information request for Christopher Ray's bills, nothing would have come back because there was no documentation. There was Wait, no paperwork. so when we heard about the uh, Chris Christie's lawyer had his cell phone thing in the summer of 2016, as you say, I remember that reporting breaking. That was the first time that we knew that Christopher Ray was working for Chris Christie, even though he had started doing that work in 2014? Correct. We knew of another attorney who was representing the governor's office who billed in excess of $11 million to right, taxpayers. Randy Mastro and his Correct. firm, right? Right, and they wrote this investigative report that basically cleared the governor of wrongdoing. We thought that was the, the lawyer. We also knew that there was a chief counsel and who was also doing work on this case, and that's we, we assumed that was it. Um, but there was another guy doing work almost every day, and that was, well, it was Christopher Ray, and we had no idea. And billing millions of dollars for it. Correct. Um, flights and meals and hotels did Matt last question did any of the any of Christopher Ray's work on Bridgegate any of these issues about disclosure any of these uh, potentially ethical issues about holding onto the cell phone or the the timing of when his work for Christie was disclosed and the retention agreement and all this stuff did any of it come up in his confirmation hearing to be FBI director Bridgegate was not mentioned once and it's of interest obviously because he was dealing with a important person and it was on the onus of the first Firm, I'm told to go and and sign that agreement and if he yielded to Chris Christie who didn't want that agreement signed right. in public very politically convenient for Christie that he that it hadn't been signed and so none of that was public record for sure and that makes it relevant whether he will yield to another powerful chief executive like the president when the time comes Matt Katz reporter with WNYC congratulations on this scoop I know that you've been on this beat for a long time but nailing down these details of it has led to um, a really important revelation thanks for helping Thank us you, Rachel. Appreciate, appreciate that. it all right, a lot to get to this very busy Monday night. Stay with us.